Good morning, mate. How are you? <laughs> I'm very well, thanks. Marcus, how are you? Yeah, good. I spoke to Pauline earlier in the week. Uh, we were surprised to hear from her uh, because, uh, you know, given what happened last week, uh, but she was very clear that she believed the uh, the recent election in Queensland was an incumbent election. And that's your first point you want to talk about this morning. Well, actually, the first thing I'd like to talk about is the state of origin. Oh. You know the score last night, mate? Uh, was there a game of football on last night? I, I, thought, I thought the footy season was over. I, there was a grand final a couple of weeks ago. Yes, I know. 18-14 uh, to Queen... Well, I nearly. Freudian slip. I nearly said New South Wales. But no, well done. <laughs> Habits break. Yeah. Oh. Yes, the, um, it, was a, it was a disappointment last Saturday at the Queensland election for us. Um, but we did retain our seat of Morani, uh, Marcus, and with an increased majority. So where we had a, a candidate, and not, not just a candidate, a sitting MP. He's actually done a fabulous job, Steve Andrew. Mm. Um, but Pauline's correct. It was an incumbent election. But I think more to the point, um, in times of fear, and that's what the Queensland Labor machine did, they created a lot of fear about COVID, uh, especially amongst the elderly. And in times of fear and something major, people tend to go not only with the incumbent, but with the, with the larger parties that the parties they supposedly know. So right. I think it was all about fear. So basically my summary of the election is um, fear won and Queensland lost because there are a lot of things being neglected. And fear of COVID was no match for the long-term vision and sensible local policies we had going. So um, that's just a summary. But we've got to learn from that. Well, absolutely. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it was quite a an amazing victory to the incumbents, um, Anastasia Palaszczuk. I mean, uh, Pauline was very adamant that, uh, you know, again, as always, as she's always done, she'll get back up, dust herself off and continue, uh, you know, with, with her thoughts and policies on, uh, you know, as to what is in the best interests of voters, not well, only in Queensland, but around the country. Yeah, exactly. And, and she and I are very similar in, in that it doesn't matter what happens. We always do what's in the national interest, in Australia's interest and in Queensland's interest. So in Queensland and New South Wales' interest, Mark Latham's doing a fabulous job holding the government accountable in New South Wales. Same with WA. Our, our uh, MPs over there in, in the upper house in WA have a very, very good record of holding the government accountable and stopping some major problems that... that should have that would have otherwise gone through yeah. marcus so it we won't stop pauline and i we will be right onto it uh, we have mm -hmm. got some things to learn and some things for the future but you know as, as a prominent brisbane radio announcer and a former state mp said never waste a crisis that's a, an established political maxim and that's what the labor machine did and he also said fear wins over optimism and when afraid people run to the incumbent and major parties and that's just the way it was all right. Now, just on this, I noticed that uh, there was uh, some comments made by James Ashby, and uh, I noticed in the notes here, uh, the demise of regional media does make it challenging to get other views out to voters other than from the major parties. Now, there have been some suggestions. Obviously, it's been a little difficult with a, a lack of media diversity in Queensland, in particular in the regions, that that's a, been a big part of the problem for One Nation. There was criticism of Pauline perhaps not being out and about enough, and I don't know whether I buy into any of that. And, of course, the other issue surrounding all of this is the fact that you just weren't able to get your message to enough people, Malcolm. That's correct. The demise of media in, in Queensland is a big factor because we are very well known on the ground. Pauline, I want to make it very clear to everyone, News Corp mis misreported, misrepresented Pauline. She didn't stop working. She is an amazing person, not just an amazing woman, an amazing person. And she was from uh, tip of Cape York, Thursday Island, all the way through to, to the Gold Coast, Coolangatta. Cape York to Coolangatta. She was all over the place on the ground. And she did a phenomenal job. And everywhere she went, she raised interest. But no one reported it. And News Corp had the temerity to say that, they, that she wasn't around. That was a complete fabrication on News Corp's part. And, she, and because of the no, local media, regional yeah. media being decimated, mm. um, the messages just didn't get out. So we're going to have to think about that, Marcus, very, very seriously. It's a great point you raised.
All right. Uh, the other issue, of course, in relation to what you've just mentioned, uh, and something that I brought up on the program this morning in relation to the former Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd, uh, his petition calling for a federal, uh, well, some sort of inquiry, whether it's a royal commission or otherwise, into News Corp, and obviously the ownership of so much media in places like Queensland. He got more than a half a million uh, signatories, uh, signatures, Before it closed at midnight last night, I see the Greens were tweeting up a storm saying that they will table it in Parliament if they get the support of Labor. So it's over to Anthony Albanese, who so far has balked at the idea. What's, what's, I guess, the the One Nation stance on this? Well, I think these days, uh, Marcus, there is so much going on in the media space. Um, the, The fact is that there's so many options for people. We have got a huge optional uh, choice of options coming on we can go to the internet we can listen to radio we can watch the we can take the local newspaper even if it's online but you know what's happening in response i can tell you what's happening you're not answering my question that's what's happening. no no i am i okay your your question is what's happening i won't be supporting the news corp uh petition against news corp because there is so much happening on the ground there are local newspapers popping up in queenslanders in Queensland and giving us the news. There are local community radio stations. There's your radio station network, which is, which will grow Marcus because people know that just like in America, they can't trust the mainstream media. They can't trust the ABC here and they're losing trust in News Corp. So they will go either into the community channels, the radios, the TVs. And that's the real issue where we've got, we've got a fabulous opportunity there. All right. Okay. Uh, all right, I'll I'll delve into that a little bit more, but I suppose uh, it's more a question for Anthony Albanese, and hopefully we'll get him on to uh, nut out the ideas there. Now the U.S. election, boy oh boy, uh, <laughs> uh, Donald Trump. Um, you say he's doing amazingly. I say he's off the bloody. He's off the. I don't know. What's going no, on with he, him? He, hey, he, he's uh, he's done a remarkable job. Um, you look at look at Michigan. Michigan is a Rust Belt state. It yeah. was uh, full of manufacturing. Manufacturing was sold out by Obama, by Clinton, uh, and by George Bush Jr. Mm. And 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 uh, Trump came along and said, Ford Motor Company, if you keep make, making cars in Mexico, then you'll pay a tariff. And Ford Motor Company then reopened the factory in Michigan. The yeah. people in Michigan love him. The people in Pennsylvania love him. Mm. And that is a testament to this man. He he said. Some things before the previous election, yep. and he damn well did it. He put, he followed up on his promises. The man is on track, I believe, to win again. The only thing that's going to stop him from winning, I think, is is corruption in the voting system, which is what he's been Hang faking on. all along. Right. Trump's done an enormous job. All right, well, have a listen to this, uh, and I want to get your thoughts on it. Uh, <laughs> here we go. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. Ah, uh, come on. Surely he uh, he went a bit early there. No, he actually was uh, slower than Biden, Marcus, because I listened to Biden's comments, and Biden's comments were similar. And he was claiming victory for the Democrats far, far too early. Right Trump had to come out. And what, what they're doing is they're both posturing hmm. to get their lawyers a good position. Um, that's the way I see it anyway, but I'm yeah. no expert. But uh, there are serious questions being asked about the numbers um, in, in some of the states, the crucial battleground states. All right. Uh, the RBA this week cut the interest rate down to, you know, uh, virtually nothing. 0.1% interest rates. I mean, it'll help people buy or stay in their homes, but there is a cost, of course. Self-funded retirees, as we've talked about on the program, who rely on investment income are seeing their returns fall to basically nothing. That's right. And, and so uh, these pr- people providing for their so-called own retirement is just hot air because the legs have been cut out from under them now. We're now at the point where retirees are having to spend their capital because the return on their nest egg is almost non-existent and heading negative. And what's disturbing is that, you know, this is going to create a lot of pressure for people at a time when people don't need it. And by printing another $100 billion and giving it to the banks, they're going to prop up the banks... Um, to do more mortgage lending. This government, the state and federal, are completely ignoring the need to invest in productive capacity. We need to invest in power stations, dams, roads, ports, bridges. 
the Iron Boomerang scheme, the Bradfield scheme, these and m- many other uh, prime investment uh, opportunities in that yeah. country are being neglected, and we need to get into building the productive capacity of our country. I spoke to Andrew Lee uh, from Labor earlier in the week on this uh, Commonwealth Integrity Commission bill. Uh, he basically says it's not a... Uh, it's an anti... Well, it's basically a toothless tiger. That's the best way uh, that I can describe his uh, description of it. Uh, Retired Victorian Supreme Court Judge Stephen Charles said this is not a corruption commission. It's designed to protect parliamentarians and senior public servants from investigation. After two years of waiting, this is a tremendous disappointment. An annual budget of $42 million when fully operational. And, of course, it, it, it will fail in its current form of how it's, you know, being sold, it will fail to hold people to account. It won't be anything like a New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption. Yeah, I I, I always make comment after doing my work on this, and I haven't done my work on this, but but some of my staff have, Marcus, and the early indications from what we can see is there will be no public hearings for public sector and, and members of parliament corruption. Well, None. that's right. And we won't and, have, and that, yeah. that's, that's the place where you need it. That's got to be out in front and transparent. The Prime Minister, the Attorney General have dragged their feet on this mm. for a couple of years now and they now produce something that falls short of the mark. And, you know, so how can, how can we do public hearings for law enforcement and police but not for members of Parliament? And for, and for public sector employees. Well, this right. is wrong. Yeah. And, and then we, we've got to have the names out in the open. People are entitled to make sure that the governments that they elect are working for the people. And that's what we need to get. We need to make sure that there is pressure on, on politicians to be clean at all times. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, under its current proposed format, uh, you won't see people like, um, you know... I mean, look what's happened in New South Wales in the last couple of months. We've had a Premier dragged before the Independent Commission of Corruption and grilled to within an inch of a personal life. <laughs> uh, that won't happen under this proposed federal uh, CIC, and that's an issue for me. Yes, and, and the Attorney General has the power to limit information that can be considered by the, the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Yeah. Um, there are also uh, the, refer- the bars for referral are way too high. Someone approaches the, uh, the institution with reasonable suspicions of, of corruption breaches, but no actual evidence. It can be ignored. And then yeah, with, there's right. no retrospectivity, which means the sport rorts, sports rorts and the Murray-Darling Basin waterbacks, mm. they won't be investigated because they were in the past. This is, this is just way, way too short of where we need to be. All right, Malcolm. Great to have you on. We'll chat soon, mate. Thank you again, as always. Thanks, Marcus.